Hi everyone, welcome to the third webinar conducted by TCS online in lieu of the upcoming uh, operational case study examinations happening in May and August 2022. And uh, in this uh, webinar, I will be taking you through uh, um, a mini mock, thereby highlighting the uh, type of answering technique which you need to adopt uh, when doing your uh, case study. And um, I hope that you would have watched the first two webinars in webinar number one i um, highlighted about how you need to prepare for the operational case study and in webinar number two i did a uh, pre seed analysis and all these things are uploaded onto our youtube channel and on top of that uh, you can access these webinars uh, the recorded sessions of these webinars via the free content area on our website and um, uh, the recorded version of this webinar will be uploaded onto our uh, website as well. Okay, so um, let's move on with the uh, study system. So let's try to figure out what the uh, ses session outcomes are. Um, so session outcomes, um, I will be uh, highlighting about answering technique as well as uh, uh, as uh, the second part of today's session, I will be discussing uh, discussing a mini mock and uh, taking you through the uh, suggested answer. And uh, whilst taking you before I take you through the suggested answer, I will be uh, telling you how to uh, as to how to prepare something called an answer plan, uh, which is of utmost importance when planning your answers. And on top of that, it helps you with managing your time. Okay, so let's look at uh, the methodology which you need to adhere to when uh, providing answers. So answering techniques, uh, you are supposed to use appropriate headings and subheadings when providing answers. So I've seen, uh, you know, uh, through my throughout my uh, SEMA tutoring career, I've seen so many students uh, who would just, you know, start typing answers without appropriate headings and subheadings. So the examiner wants you to come up with uh, headings and subheadings and the examiner wants you to stick to a certain format when uh, you come up with headings and subheadings. So the examiner wants you to have uh, headings which are bold and underlined and your subheadings need to be just bold. Okay, so um, when you take a certain task, I said that in your exam, uh, there would be uh, four main tasks. And let's take just one single task. Under a single task, you would have two to three subtasks. So uh, let's assume there is a question that there are three subtasks. In that case, you need to have three sub three main headings. Okay, if there are three subheadings in one task, you need to have three main headings. And uh, under each main heading, if you want to bring out or highlight a certain area separately, you need to come up with a subheading. You'd understand what I'm talking about when I'm taking you through the suggested answer of the mini mock, which I'm going to discuss tonight. Okay, so you need to use headings and subheadings appropriately. Headings need to be bold and underlined and subheadings need to be just in bold format. And when providing answers, you are supposed to provide um, uh, answers in paragraphs and each paragraphs, uh, paragraph needs to consist of two to four sentences, nothing less, nothing more. The examiner discourages you to provide answers in bullet points or uh, the examiner discourages you to provide answers in single lined sentences. Instead, you need to come up with paragraphs because uh, um, uh, it makes, if, if you provide answers in paragraphs, you are sticking to the uh, format stipulated by the examiner. And on top of that, the examiner will find it extremely easy to mark your answers. I've seen so many students when they start typing their answers, uh, you know, let's assume in, in, in a certain subtask, uh, you are supposed to come up with uh, five or six um, answer points. So all these five or six answer points, if you write it together in one single paragraph, the uh, examiner or the marker or the invigilator would find it extremely hard to pick out the relevant content of your answer. So uh, please be mindful, although you are taking three hours 
to um, you know uh, attempt your mock not not your mock actually uh, although you are taking 3 hours to attempt your exam and a typical invigilator takes about 13 to 15 minutes to mark your paper okay so when marking your paper within 13 to 15 minutes if you can make the invigilate in invigilator's life easier then you are in a position to gain better marks so please stick to the format stipulated by uh, the sema examiner when providing answers if there are five or six answer points which you need to highlight then you need to have five or six paragraphs in your answer so for each answer point you need to come up with a paragraph and each paragraph needs to consist uh, two to four sentences so please be mindful of it don't write everything together under one single paragraph because you might end up losing marks uh, if you do not stick to the format stipulated by the SEMA examiner and ideally uh, each task uh, when when providing answers ideally you need to have a 650 uh, you need to have 650 to 700 words per 45 minute task so in your exam there are four tasks and each task carries a time allocation of 45 minutes and when coming up with your answers you need to make sure that uh, your answers come up to 650 to 700 words so that's exactly why i would suggest you to go through five uh, mock exams you know attempt them try to figure out your word count and when I'm providing uh, feedback, if you had opted for the value pack, when I'm providing feedback, I'll be, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to figure out whether uh, you have uh, uh, st stuck to this word limit, because um, you cannot provide fulfilling answers if you uh, give answers which are less than this word count. Let's assume that uh, you provide answers for a certain task which consists of 400 words then you are not in a position to gain full marks because if you cover all the areas of the, a certain task, definitely your word count would be somewhere around 650 to 750. You can you know, exceed this word limit, that's totally fine. But if you write less, then you uh, have a good chance of losing marks, okay? And um, uh, when it comes to planning your answers and when it comes to typing your answers, one third of your time should be allocated for reading and planning and two thirds of your time should be allocated for typing. Okay, so 15 to 20 minutes, you can take 15 to 20 minutes to uh, read and plan your answer and the remaining uh, time, uh, 30 minutes or 25 minutes should be allocated for typing. Um, so again, I'm highlighting most students, what they do is they would read a question and straight away they'd start typing answers. I'm not recommending you to do that because uh, the examiner wants you to spend some quality time to plan the answer of the entire task. Because if you do not plan the answer, you are not in a position to figure out whether you are headed in the correct direction or not. You know, you know in most instances, what happens is students start typing answers and halfway through they figure out that they are you know, headed in the wrong direction or they figure out that they are not fulfilling the requirement of the task. So they would end up deleting the answers and retyping. And uh, once you do something like that, you end up running out of time. Okay. And um, uh, most of the time when you end up deleting your answers at the exam, you would go into panic mode because of that, it leads to brain freeze. So if you panic in task number one, in the uh, subsequent tasks, uh, tasks two, three, and four, you would be in panic mode because of that you won't uh, have uh, the ability to think straight. So in order to avoid it, what I'm suggesting you to do is you need to plan your answers appropriately. So spend 15 to 20 minutes to plan your answer. That is known as an answer plan. I'll be highlighting how to do it tonight, okay? So spend 15 to 20 minutes to plan your answer. And once you have a appropriate plan, once you know uh, what type of points need to be covered in your answer, then it's just a matter of, uh, you know, typing your answers, okay? So you can take 25 to 30 minutes to type your answers. Uh, and that's the best practice which you need to adhere to, to gain good marks. 
and uh, expect a typing speed is a minimum of 20 words per minute uh, you know most of the time uh, uh, you know since uh, almost all the students doing the operational case study are involved with the corporate sector this is not a problem you know typing uh, 20 words per minute is not a real problem and uh, weightage for each requirement is allocated under each subtask and based on that you need to allocate your timing as well okay so uh, again i will highlight this point when i'm taking you through the uh, suggested answer when i'm discussing the mini mock uh, in that i've uh, you, know, you know i've mentioned the weightages for each subtask and based that based on that only you need to determine how many marks are allocated for each subtask and based on the mark allocation you can determine how many answer points you need to bring out and on top of that uh, based on these weightage you can also figure out how much of time you need to allocate for per each subtask so that's that i will be talking about this later on do not spend time on formatting uh, you know working on paragraph alignment and stuff like that because that's uh, not part of your requirements so don't be too concerned about it remember it's always about the quality of the points not the quantity so I've highlighted this point earlier as well in um, um, uh, webinar number one, I highlighted this point where I said that the examiner is uh, uh, really concerned about the content of your answer, the quality of your answer rather than the quantity. Okay, just because you write paragraphs and paragraphs of irrelevant answers, uh, you know, you won't end up getting marks. So your answers need to be totally relevant to the task at hand. Answers need to be totally relevant to your company as well as industry dynamics. So the examiner is looking at quality. So in order to make sure that you achieve the required level of quality, I would suggest that uh, you stick to the plan which I stipulated earlier, where you need to spend 15 to 20 minutes planning your answer. And once you have a plan, you can, you know, uh, use utilize the remaining time to type your answers so that's what you need to focus on with regards to answering technique and uh, when um, developing answers uh, you need to stick to this process first things first you need to read the scenario okay you need to understand the scenario which is stipulated because if you do not understand the scenario uh, you cannot provide the uh, relevant answers so that's exactly why I said you need to take 15 to 20 minutes to read and plan the answer. So read the scenario first properly and plot the requirements into subheadings. So you need to, after uh, you know reading the scenario and uh, the tasks, you need to plot the requirements into subheadings. I'll show you how to do it later. And you need, then after you have uh, come up with subheadings, you need to invest time to understand the requirement clearly. So, uh, for instance, uh, when you read the scenario or the requirements first, if you're not in a position to really understand what is stipulated, it is recommended that you reread the requirement because if you do not understand the requirement, you end up giving the wrong answer. Okay, so you are supposed to read and understand the requirement clearly. Then after that, you are supposed to plan the answer. So a maximum uh, of one thirds of your time should be allocated as I stipulated earlier. 15 to 20 minutes should be allocated uh, for the answer plan. And uh, when uh, coming up with the answer plan, uh, you know, plan the answer on the answer screen, answer screen itself. Uh, give me a second, please. I'll mute. Right. Okay. Right. So uh, when when planning the answer, when coming up with the answer plan. Plan the answer on the answer screen itself. Don't, uh, you know, go to use the scratch pad because as part of your, uh, you know, um, 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 you know, system, uh, the uh, examination platform, you will have access to a scratch pad. I'm not, you know, uh, to, uh, I'm not recommending you to uh, use the scratch pad because uh, there aren't any numbers uh, or, or any calculations which you are supposed to carry out at the operational case study level. So because of that, uh, when coming up with the answer plan, when coming up with the sub subheadings and whatnot, do it on the answer screen itself. And after you uh, come up with the answer plan, expand the points in the 
answer plan. So once you have the answer plan on the answer screen itself, you can expand the same points. I will uh, show you how to do it later. Right. Okay. So um, there could be students who are, you know, attempting the operational case study for the second time, or, you know, you might have failed this examination on multiple locations. So in such a scenario, what are you supposed to do? Okay. You need to figure out whether you gave your best or not. So you need to do your own personal reflection. Uh, what I've seen is, uh, you know, in most instances, um, you know, uh, students do not find enough time to spend on uh, exam practice or practice mock exams, seek personal feedback and whatnot. So as I've highlighted in uh, webinar number one, uh, there are six weeks between um, the pre-seen release date and the examination date. So there are six weeks and you need to be smart to come up with an appropriate uh, plan uh, or, or a study plan to be precise so that you utilize your limited time appropriately. Okay. And uh, please remember you are, you know, running your own businesses or you might be, uh, you know, working in corporate environments and you might have your family uh, commitments and whatnot. So uh, just because you are doing a CMA exam, you can't allocate 100% attention towards this. So you need to come up with a solid study plan where you, um, you know, allocate enough time to prepare yourself within six weeks. So most in most instances, why students fail is because uh, they do not do enough mock exams. If you do not do five mock exams, your chances of uh, passing the uh, uh, case study is extremely low because uh, you need to practice. You need to uh, practice how uh, 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 with regards to uh, development of answer plans, time management, uh, what type of answers you provide, you need to figure out whether your answers are in par with the requirements uh, stipulated, whether your answers are uh, of high, whether you are providing high quality answers and whatnot, okay? And whether you have enough knowledge pertaining to E1, F1 and P1 areas. So you need to figure out all these things. So in most instances, students only work towards the end or uh, nearing the exam. So in the last two weeks, students uh, go into panic mode and they just do two or three mock exams and uh, attempt the case study and end up failing. So you need to do your personal reflection. You need to figure out why you failed. If you failed, you need to figure out why you failed last time. Okay. And um, where try to ask this question from yourself. Where did I go wrong in the exam? You need to uh, diagnose the reason first and address them this time. So if there are three or four reasons, let's assume there are three reasons which led to your failure, you need to come up with three solutions for, uh, or, or you need to come up with a solution for each uh, uh, reason for failure. Refer to the mini mocks and suggested answers as well as the examiner's report to figure out, uh, you know, uh, whether you had given appropriate answers or not. Okay, whether your answers uh, or the, the uh, answering methodology which you adhere to is in line with the SEMA requirements, try to figure that out. And, uh, you know, if you keep on failing and if you kept on failing on multiple locations, uh, I would suggest you to seek personalized feedback. You know, most of the time students uh, fail because they, you know, use substandard mocks or they do not uh, attempt enough mocks or in most instances, if especially if you are coming through the exemption route or the FLP route, uh, it's highly recommended that you seek personalized feedback. And if you didn't do it last time, you know, if you saw it as, um, you know, um, an unwanted cost an unnecessary cost, you know, seeking personalized feedback, I would suggest that you, uh, you know, go for it this time because you can't keep, uh, failing exams. You need to figure out where you are going wrong. So that's where uh, personalized feedback um, will be beneficial for you. And based on all these things, you need to come up with an action plan and you need to stick to that action plan and work hard and smarter than the previous attempt. And uh, I would suggest you, you know, if you, if you failed last time or on multiple locations, if you failed on multiple locations, I would suggest you to go to uh, go onto our website 
and uh, in it there's this uh, blog post uh, which is uh, you know dedicated towards uh, people who had failed okay so the title of the blog post is reasons for failure issues and solutions so i've highlighted the most common reasons faced by students uh, when they fail uh, with with regards to failing the exam and for each problem i've provided solutions so please go through these things uh, if you had failed last time. Okay, then uh, you need to avoid unnecessary deflections as well. So uh, most in, in most instances, I've seen students uh, overemphasizing on the exam blueprint. Absolutely no point of doing that. The exam blueprint is there to give you a, a basic uh, understanding about what happened in a, a previous examination just going through the uh, 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 previous pre-scenes or the, the exam variants. Past variants won't help you in this exam because the past variants are based on a different pre-scene. So for instance, uh, there, are, there, there have been situations uh, where, I'm, where, where when, when I'm having a chat with a student, the student says, you know, they referred to past variants, but these past variants, uh, these questions didn't appear in the examination. Uh, that is the case because uh, if the past variant was based on a company in the service sector, and if your company is based in the manufacturing sector, the type of questions which would come your way are totally different. And uh, the type of questions which will come your way depends on uh, the technical nitty gritties, which are totally different in each and every uh, pre-scene which is released every six months. So don't uh, overemphasize on the exam blueprint and uh, over-reliance on predictions uh, will definitely kill you because um, I've seen so many tutors uh, talking about predictions. The examiner in the examiner's report specifically mentioned, uh, mentions that uh, students need not or students should not rely on predictions because you can't predict any of the questions which will appear in your exam. Okay, so don't do that as well. Uh, and excessive industry analysis, that's not necessary because you are playing the role of a finance officer. You are at the operational level of the organization. So as an individual at the operational level, you need not be an ex industry expert, just having some type of knowledge about the industry or the most just uh, you know understanding and knowing uh, the most important points um, will help you in the exam other than that uh, there's absolutely no point of doing excessive industry analysis and misguided use of past papers yes uh, if you refer to uh, past variants as i highlighted earlier it will not uh, if 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 these past variants are not too suitable to the pre seen uh, or the current pre-scene, then you are wasting your time. And um, I've seen students, uh, you know, dealing with uh, or, or not having the capability to deal with information overload because uh, information overload comes into the picture where you listen to too many people, you know, uh, when your, your colleagues are saying, okay, this area can be tested and other colleagues says, you know, that area might not be tested, something else will be tested and you go through the exam blueprint too much, you go do uh, excessive industry analysis, you go through past papers too much, uh, you uh, listen to various different tutors predicting, uh, you know, uh, multiple scenarios. So all these things lead to information overload. Uh, you just have six weeks, so you need to be smart uh, when it comes to um, coming up with a study plan. Uh, what I would suggest is, you know, um, stick to a solid plan. You can, again, there's a blog post about uh, what type of uh, a methodology which you can uh, adhere to when it comes to study planning or coming up with a study plan. So I would ask you to read. There's a blog post on our, on, on our blog. Uh, which is titled as the uh, pre-scene is out, what now? That's the title of the blog. So please go through that. Uh, that gives you best practice with, which you can adopt when coming up with a study plan. Um, just do five mock exams, go through the pre-scene document, go through the additional material which we are providing. The most important thing is doing five mock exams and going through the suggested answers. 
that would do don't listen to your colleagues or different types of predictions done by different types of individuals okay so you need to avoid these deflections and uh, let me talk about what we offer before we move on to uh, uh, discussing the mock so we offer two packages as uh, you know already the essential pack and the value pack and in in the essential pack uh, you would have access to full pre seen analysis videos so there are four videos video number 1 is the introduction uh, video number 2 is an industry analysis video number 3 highlights the company operations and in video number 4 i've highlighted the financial um, um, state uh, uh, i've carried out a financial analysis based on the financial statements and we are providing something called an annotated pre scene which makes your life easier to decrypt uh, the pre scene i've highlighted all the uh, main points which you need to remember and on top of that, I've highlighted uh, any areas uh, which can be tested at the exam based on the information provided in the pre scene And we are providing a separate industry analysis document in order to make sure that you better understand the industry dynamics. And the most important product which you are offering is uh, five exam standard mock exams and suggested answers. And um, there's a, fine, a set of uh, slides for financial analysis so that you better understand the financial performance of the company. Uh, we've highlighted about top 10 likely scenarios which can be tested uh, in the examination and there's an OCS familiarization kit uh, which is ex extremely beneficial for students who are uh, doing their uh, CMA case study for the first time or students who are coming through the FLP route and you'd have access to the WhatsApp discussion forum and there's a pass guarantee and this pass guarantee uh, would entail that uh, uh, if you if, if by any chance you fail uh, the examination after using our uh, product, then you would have uh, access to the same type of uh, uh, product in the subsequent session without a charge. Okay, and the investment is going to be ninety nine pounds. And uh, in the value pack, the same stuff uh, which appears under the uh, essential pack uh, uh, is there. And on top of that, you would have access to an online mock exam platform, which is. Uh, uh, which replicates the uh, Pearson VUE system. So it's better to get accustomed to the exam platform. And uh, when attempting your five mock exams, you can do it on our exam platform itself, which makes your life easier, which helps you to uh, keep track of time uh, as well as, uh, uh, you know, typing speed and whatnot. Then uh, we are also providing uh, professional marking and feedback on three mocks. So out of the five mocks, we provide professional marking for uh, mocks three, four, and five. And um, especially if you are if you had failed on multiple locations, especially if you are coming through the FLP route, or if you are returning to SEMA, study, uh, SEMA studies after a prolonged study break, then I would suggest that you go for the value pack because you have professional marking uh, services. So you have access to professional marking services, um, um, you know, I myself will be marking all your uh, uh, papers or your answers, and I'll be uh, providing comprehensive feedback, which will uh, help you immensely uh, at the examination. And we are offering theory recaps for E1, F1, P1. Uh, if you feel that you need to brush up your knowledge pertaining to E1, F1, and P1, you can go through our three theory re re recap slides as well. So the investment is going to be £199. All right, so having said that, uh, let's move on to the second part of today's session, which is about the about discussion of the mini mock. So let me take you to the mini mock now. Give me a second, please. I'm trying to change screens. Guys, um, I've uh, changed my screen. Can you see my screen? It should say mini mock questions.
All right, thanks guys. Okay, so um, we are looking at uh, a mini mock. So this mini mock, usually in your, um, you know, SEMA um, operational case study paper, as I told you earlier, there will be four tasks, but uh, since this is a mini mock, there are only two tasks and each task carries a, a time allocation of 45 minutes. And in each task, you can see that there are three subtasks. And uh, I was talking about the weightage provided. So, um, you know, these are the weightages which I was talking about. So the first task has three subtasks and the first subtask carries a uh, weightage of 30%, the second 40% and the third 30%. So based on these weightages, you need to uh, figure out the time allocation as well as how much of marks are allocated for each and every subtask. So I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about it right now because I'm going to highlight these points later on when looking at the suggested answer. Okay, so section number one, a 45 minute question. Uh, today is the 1st of October, 2022 and Mails at Home has carried out the quarterly performance review. You receive the following email from the finance manager. So you are receiving an, an email from your finance manager. Your finance manager's name is Claire Turner. Uh, so the subject is about training and development budgeting and relevant costing. So in this task, three uh, separate areas are tested, training and development, budgeting, as well as uh, uh, relevant costing. So um, Claire Turner is telling you, we have decided to launch, spe launch a special training and development session for our packaging employees to enhance the quality of our operations. So please be mindful about it. Um, we are not just doing a general, uh, you know, uh, training and development program. We are carrying, we are planning to carry out a training and development program focused primarily on our packaging employees. And why are we carrying out this uh, training and development program in order to enhance the quality of operations? Okay, so that's the main point which is stipulated here. We are conducting the TND session for uh, packaging employees and why are we doing it? To enhance the quality of packaging operations. In line with this initiative, Meena Jaff, the HRD uh, manager, asked me to do a presentation on the training and development program, which we need to follow for our employees involved with packaging operations. Okay, so Meena Jaff is saying that, uh, you know, uh, Claire Turner needs to do a presentation about training and development. Therefore, could you please draft me a report on the steps which we need to follow in our training and development program? So first things first, your requirement highlights the fact that you need to talk about the steps we need to follow when developing a training and development program. So an E1 related area is tested. I In, in webinar number one, I said that the examinees are, uh, you know, trying to figure out whether a student has a capability, has the capability of applying theoretical knowledge brought in from E1, F1 and P1. So this subtask is primarily concerned with an E1 related area, which is training and development. And um, the examiner is trying to figure out whether you have enough knowledge about the training and development cycle, okay? I believe that we will be able to continue the training and development program in the coming years if we could generate better output this time. Okay, and the uh, allocated um, uh, weightage is 30%. Okay, so let's try to figure out uh, what type of an answer you are supposed to provide. Okay, give me a second, please. Uh, right. Okay, so when you go into the answer, so first things first, uh, I stipulated that you need to stick to a certain methodology when coming up with an answer plan. So that's exactly what you see here. So the question, the first subtask is about steps in training and development. So you need to type that because I said, um, you know, when developing an answer plan, you need to come up with appropriate headings and subheadings. And I also stipulated for each subtask, you need to come up with a main heading. So this is what I've done based on the requirements of the task. I've stipulated which area is tested or what the exact requirement is. So the requirement for subtask one is 
highlighting the steps in training and development uh, steps of the training and development cycle so that's uh, what i've highlighted here so based on that i've uh, come up with an answer plan so training and development stages okay first things first we have to identify our training needs then we need to set our training and development objectives we have to plan our training we have to then deliver uh, our training session or implement the training session and at the very end we have to evaluate our training session so these are the five uh, steps which you need to adhere to when developing a training and uh, development session so um, on top of that so we have come up with the five steps now after stipulating the five steps you need to uh, come up with uh, points or, or you need to develop points under each main area so when identifying the training and uh, when identifying training needs what are you supposed to do you are supposed to develop the training session based on issues faced at the moment so what are we trying to achieve through this uh, you know training and development session we are trying to increase the efficiency of our packaging staff members so in the question uh, nothing is mentioned about any issues which we had faced at the moment so i'm not going to talk about issues i'm just going to say uh, you know when developing the training and uh, training uh, you know training and development uh, uh, program we have to figure out whether there are any issues at the moment and based on the issues in order to overcome the issues only we have to develop a t and d session so that's step number 1 then we are moving on to step number 2 uh, when stipulating training and development objectives, what are we trying to achieve? We are trying to achieve efficiency in packaging. So our TND objectives should be based on achieving efficiency in packaging. So from where did I get this information? I got it from the question. So you need to relate to the question as much as possible. There's absolutely no point of providing highly theoretical areas. If a student just stipulated the five steps, without relating to the question or without relating to the requirement, um, the student will end up getting minimal marks. And uh, so that's that. So uh, our train TND objectives needs to be based on achieving efficiency in packaging. And when stipulating our TND objectives, uh, we need to fulfill the smart characteristics. Our TND objectives need to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So that's that. That's the second step. Then we are moving on to the third step. Uh, we need to plan the training and development session. So when planning the TND session, we need to look into different types of areas. We need to figure out the training methods. Are we going for formal training or informal training? Okay, the location of uh, uh, of of the training session. Who are the training providers? Are we you know uh, use you are we going to utilize the uh, internal staff members or, or senior staff members or are we going to use um, you know external parties external uh, uh, training and development providers and on top of that as part of, as part of the uh, tnd uh, 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 session we have to uh, come up with a budget as well so these are the things which we need to do in the uh, when when carrying out planning pertaining to the training sessions which we are going to conduct then when it comes to delivery and impl implementation, we need to figure out who's going to handle delivery. Are we going to handle delivery in-house? If that is the case, we need to use uh, senior staff members. We need to select the staff members who are going to be involved with delivery. Uh, or are we going to use uh, external help uh, using external trainers? And um, whilst uh, you know delivering, we need to again think whether we are achieving our TND objectives. What was our training and development objective to achieve efficiency in packaging? So we need to figure out whether the training and development uh, session which we are carrying out helps us fulfill our training and development objective of improving efficiency in packaging. So that's what happens in uh, you know step number four. And in step number five, we have to evaluate uh, whether we conducted the training and development session in the most efficient manner or in the most effective manner in order to figure that out we need to gain feedback from trainers as well as attendees okay 
So that's your answer for the first subtask with regards to training and development. So let's try to figure out what type of an answer you are supposed to provide based on the answer plan. So I highlighted how to come up with an answer plan. I said you need to you know, spend some time to uh, uh, structure your answer, plan your answer. So provide or, or when, when, when coming up with the answer plan, you need to do it in, in a precise uh, uh, or, or not precise, actually in a concise manner. You need, to you, you need to come up with a summary. So that's why I call it an answer plan. So based on the summary, once you have a structure, it's a matter of just typing out your answer. So let's try to figure out what type of an answer, uh, a fully fledged answer you are supposed to provide. So stages to be followed uh, when carrying out a training and development program. Uh, so under training and development plan, we need to follow the following steps. So step number one is identifying training and development needs. Since we are focusing on packaging employees, we need to identify the issues with their performance and design training programs to bridge areas of underperformance. So I've covered this area in my answer plan. So the first point is done. Then we are moving on to the second point, setting training and development objectives. When setting uh, these objectives, these objectives should be in line with the achievement of efficiency in packaging operations. Thus, the objective should be clear, specific, and measurable. So I was talking about smart characteristics. I've highlighted uh, about them in here. Then planning the training and development session. Uh, when coming up with plans, we have to look at training methods, uh, you know, sources from where are we getting our, uh, you know, uh, 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 trainers? Are we using internal trainers or external trainers? We need to set budgets. Uh, we need to stipulate the location providers of training and division of responsibilities because there would be certain uh, administrative tasks which you need to carry out. So that needs to be inculcated in the uh, training and development plan. Then uh, the fourth step is uh, delivering and implementing training and development initiatives. So a combination of formal, informal, internal and external training methods can be used when delivering the training session. And during the whole process, we need to examine training sessions to make sure that we are achieving our training objectives. I highlighted that point in my answer plan as well. Then the last point is evaluating training and development sessions. After delivering the training, the whole process needs to be evaluated to track its effectiveness. If there are any errors, we need to rectify them by listening to feedback from trainers and packaging staff members. Okay, so that's your answer. So what I've done is I've come up with a skeleton plan and when typing the answers, I have fleshed it out. I've, you know, uh, provided a fully fledged answer. So that's uh, the benefit of having an answer plan rather than, you know, um, you know, reading the question and, uh, you know, if, if you start typing the answer straight away, you might be headed in the wrong direction rather than doing that. It's uh, uh, prudent if you spend some time to come up with an answer structure or an answer plan and based on that you can flesh it out uh, when typing the answer. Okay, so that's uh, the answer for the first area. Then we are moving on to the second subtask. Further, during the board meeting, there was a discussion regarding different budgeting styles and the level of people involvement in the budgetary process. The finance director asked me to provide a report evaluating the benefits and drawbacks of the imposed and participating participative budgeting styles. So that's the requirement. Okay. What's the requirement of subtask B? Uh, evaluating the benefits, benefits and drawbacks of imposed as well as participative budgeting. Since I'm busy with work, could you please provide me an explanation to the above mentioned requirement? So Let's look at the uh, answer plan for that budgeting style. So when uh, you know providing an answer for this type of a question, it's better to define what budgeting is. So start with a definition, then move on to elaborating uh, what an imposed and participative style of budgeting is about. Okay, so uh, when talking about Im because uh, in, as per the task, you are supposed to talk about the pros and cons of imposed as well as participative budgeting. So when starting your answer, 
pertaining to imposed style of budgeting start with a definition then move on to the pros okay pros are it's less time consuming uh, you know you can um, achieve fast decision making because the decisions pertaining to budgets are taken by the heads of the company uh, you know you are, you are not uh, you know uh, you know making sure you are not allowing the low level employees to be part and parcel of the budget setting process so you can take your decisions faster and uh, you are using the expertise of capable managers who uh, carries an overall view of the business who has a good understanding about the vision and mission the value system of the business so these uh, top level managers are in a position to set uh, better budgets because they know about budgeting they know uh, how to uh, be involved with the budgetary process so these are the pros let's look at the cons uh, you know the decision makers can't access local knowledge because they are taking their decisions on their own uh, without uh, ensuring that uh, the low level managers participate in the budget setting process uh, this leads to uh, uh, demotivating lower level employees okay because they know that their uh, concerns are not taken into consideration then uh, because of this when it comes to implementing imposed style of budgets you might face some resistance so these are the cons uh, pertaining to imposed style of budgeting then we are moving on to participative budgeting again start by defining what uh, participative budgeting is then highlight the pros uh, can access local knowledge uh, because we are listening to low level employees low level managers uh, because we are listening to them it motivates employees okay and employees are committed towards achieving the budgets because they uh, you know they have they themselves have set the budget so they are they'll be uh, committed towards achieving the budget uh, you know uh, relative to an imposed style of budgeting then let's look at the cons it's time consuming it takes a lot of time because you need to listen to uh, you know too many employees because they they participate in the budget setting process uh, which leads to um, complications in uh, decision making you need to listen to a lot of people higher the number of people uh, higher the complication uh, complications you would have to face uh, when it comes to decision making and uh, in participative budgeting a major problem is with regards to budgetary slack where the you know employees or the managers would try to set easily achievable budget so this is also known as budget padding so these are the answer this is the answer plan so once you know the answer plan it's a matter of just uh, you know typing the answer so let's try to figure out what type of an answer i've uh, come up with based on my answer plan so evaluation of budgeting styles um, I, 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 I've started with uh, defining what a budget is. Uh, budgeting refers to the process of developing a quantitative plan. And there are different styles for budgeting. And two options are there, imposed and participative. So that's my definition. Then I'm moving on to imposed style of budgeting. Again, I'm starting with the, with, uh, the definition pertaining to imposed style of budgeting. Um, it does not facilitate the budget holder or employees and the operational managers to participate in the budget preparation process okay right so let's look at the advantages uh, it's less time consuming decisions can be made relatively faster also if our low level managers lack the skill to prepare budgets then this style is suitable since this utilizes the expertise of higher level managers all these points were stipulated in my answer plan Further, since top level managers have an overall view and the vision of the organization, they are better poised to prepare budgets, right? So these are the pros. Let's look at the disadvantages. We won't be able to get local knowledge of operational managers and other low level employees. I highlighted that point in my answer plan. Since the budget does not consider the idea of low level employees, we could face resistance when implementing budgets. Again, I highlighted this point in my answer plan. This could lead to a demotivation, lead to demotivation among low level employees. Okay, that's that. Then we are moving on to participative budgeting. Uh, again, I'm starting by defining what participative budgeting is. Uh, this is a system where we facilitate operational managers and the low level employees to participate in the budget setting process. This ensures that the company can benefit from local knowledge, thus increasing the effectiveness of the budget setting process. So I'm highlighting the pros now. 
then it leads to increased motivation, greater commitment towards uh, achieving budgets, and we won't face any resistance as well. So these are the advantages of participative style. Then the disadvantages are it takes more time for us to uh, prepare budgets and it leads to budgetary slack, also known as budget padding, uh, which is a scenario where uh, low level managers try to set budgets which are easily achievable. So based on that, I've done a general analysis. You know, you are not supposed to, uh, you know, provide uh, a general analysis, but if you do, uh, if it makes sense, you will end up getting, uh, you know, additional marks okay so general analysis when considering the most suitable style we need to consider both benefits and drawbacks of each and consider meals at homes corporate objectives so uh, when you know going for an imposed style of budgeting or a participative style of budgeting we need to figure out the objectives of the company uh, and our budgeting style selected budgeting style needs to be in line or aligned with the objectives which we are trying to achieve as a company okay so that's the answer for the second subtask so let's uh, move on to the third subtask and i'll try to do it quickly because we are running out of time uh, so the third subtask uh, um, in the third subtask it's highlighted moreover we have received special requests from abc and xyz which are well renowned trading companies which sell reconditioned industrial machines. So we have gotten quotations from two companies which are involved with selling reconditioned industrial machines. Both these companies are interested in purchasing five of our machines which are used for mail kit bag production. So these guys want to purchase five of our machines. Uh, I thought to do a cost benefit analysis before selecting the preferred course of action. I have attached all the relevant information, see reference material one. So you need to, uh, you know, uh, see reference material to figure out what this uh, relevant information is about with regards to the five machines uh, uh, which we are going to sell. Okay. So you are supposed to carry out a relevant cost analysis and evaluate the decision which we need to take either to keep our bag production machines or sell them. So, you know, uh, two parties had approached us asking whether we are interested to sell five of our bag production machines. So based on the additional information provided, you are supposed to stipulate whether we are supposed to uh, keep the machines or sell them to um, either of the uh, trading companies who had, uh, which had approached us. Okay. So let's look at the uh, additional material or reference material provided information about bag production machines. Number of bag production machines are five. Book value of machines is N dollars 1 million. Annual depreciation charge is N dollars 100,000. As these machines are nearing its useful life, the company has no intention to replace them with similar machines. So once we stop using them, you know, uh, we won't uh, get similar machines. We are gonna, uh, you know, purchase better machines or, or technologically advanced machines. Present value of future cash flows associated with the machine. So how, how much are we going to generate uh, by the end of uh, the useful life of these machines? How much of revenues are we going to generate? It amounts to N dollars 1.2 million. So let's look at the quotations provided by the two uh, trading companies. Quotation provided by ABC. Sell the machines at, pre at present condition for N dollars 900,000. So we sell it at present condition and gain revenues amounting to uh, not revenues actually cash inflows amount into n dollars nine hundred thousand. So let's look at the quotation provided by XYZ. Sell the machine for one point one million dollars after replacing rewinding shafts. To replace the rewinding shafts, it will cost us one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for five machines. So according to the quotation provided by XYZ, we are supposed to get if we sell our, our five machines, we are supposed to. Um, uh, get cash inflows amount into 1.1 million. However, it results in an additional cost amount into 150,000 because we have to replace the rewinding shafts. So based on all this information, what type of an answer are you supposed to provide? What type of a recommendation are you supposed to provide? So relevant costing, uh, first things first, again, start by defining what relevant costing is. 
and um, then uh, talk about the characteristics which we need to stipulate. So uh, under relevant costing. So uh, we consider future costs and revenues to be uh, relevant. We consider incremental cash flows to be relevant. Non-cash flow items are considered to be irrelevant. So you start by defining what you are going to uh, talk about. The conceptual, uh, you know, or the theoretical uh, information is provided in here. Then we relate our answer to the task at hand. So first things first, we have to look at the book value. So the book value is uh, one million dollars. So I'm saying that it's a sunk cost because we have already spent one million dollars at the point of purchase. So when we purchased these machines, we had you know incurred this amount of money, uh, incurred this uh, cash outflow because of that it is considered as a sunk cost. Then let's look at depreciation because it is uh, you know they have mentioned about depreciation in here annual depreciation charge of n dollars one hundred thousand. Depreciation is a non cash flow item because of that it's considered to be irrelevant. Okay. Then present value of future cash flows. Present value of future cash flows amounts to uh, $1.2 million. Okay. Uh, present value of future cash flows are relevant because as I highlighted earlier, future costs and revenues are considered to be relevant costs. So because of that, uh, this PV, present value of future cash flows becomes relevant and uh, the cash flow of 1.2 million needs to be considered as a relevant cash inflow. Then the quoted prices uh, are quote, the prices quoted by ABC as well as XYZ. Both the prices are considered to be relevant because these are considered as incremental cash flows. Because of us taking a decision, it results in incremental cash flows. So at the very end, you are supposed to provide an overall evaluation. Why? Because you are supposed to carry out a relevant cost analysis and evaluate the decision which we need to take either to keep our bag production machines or sell them. So at the very end, you need to say based on the analysis, relevant cost analysis, which you carried out, you need to say whether we need to keep our bag production machines or sell them to either ABC or XYZ. Okay, so the evaluation is use machines rather than selling them because it generates a revenue of $1.2 million. That's the future present value of future cash flows associated uh, with using the machines, which amounts to $1.2 million. So I'm suggesting that uh, rather than selling the machines, we use them. Why am I saying it? I can't simply say, you know, we are supposed to use it. I'm, I'm supposed to justify in webinar number one, I said, if I'm, you know, uh, making a suggestion, I'm supposed to justify each suggestion. So this is the justification which I'm providing. The best quote which we have gotten is uh, 1.1 million. The closest quote, closest to the uh, present value of future cash flows is 1.1 million. However, we are not actually receiving 1.1 million. We have to spend money to fix the rewinding shafts. So 1.1 million minus 150,000 comes up to uh, uh, 950,000. So that's the second best alternative we have. So 950,000 rather than selling our machines for $950,000. If we keep using it, we would be generating $1.2 million, which results in additional cash flows amounting to 250,000. That's 1.2 million minus 950,000. So that's your answer. Let's try to figure out how I've uh, fleshed out the uh, uh, answer plan. Okay, so relevant cost analysis, I start with uh, defining what relevant costing is, costs and revenues that change as a direct result of a decision taken. So that's uh, what's considered. So let's look at the characteristics. Uh, it needs to be future costs and revenues. Incremental costs are considered to be relevant. Uh, future costs and revenues, if they are to be relevant, must be cash flows arising as a direct consequence of the decision taken and relevant costs do not include items that do not involve cash flows or non-cash uh, non cash items or non-cash flow items are not considered to be relevant. So that's our definition. I've highlighted the characteristics as well. Then let's move on to uh, the nitty gritties. Uh, book value and depreciation. Book value is a sunk cost. 
because of that it's not uh, relevant. We have already incurred the cost of the machines at the point of purchase. Depreciation charges are does not result in actual cash flows, so because of that it's irrelevant as well. Present value and the quotation prices. Present value is considered to be relevant because we won't be able to obtain a value of n dollars 1.2 million if we sold our machines to ABC or XYZ. Okay, so because of us taking a decision, it results in cash flows. So in such a context, we consider um, it to be relevant. It to be a relevant revenue. Then prices quoted by ABC and XYZ are relevant because we won't be able to generate those revenues unless we sell our machines to them. And uh, because of that, these are considered to be incremental cash flows. So at the very end, you are supposed to evaluate the decision. Uh, I believe that it is financially beneficial for us to use the machines over its useful period since we would uh, generate an additional positive cash flow of n dollars 250000 considering the best quotation provided by xyz which is 950000 after reducing the cost of replacing rewinding shafts so 1.2 million minus 950000 is the additional cash flow of 250000 okay so that's your answer so i stipulated how to develop your uh, you know, answer plans based on the requirement. And based on the answer plan, I've highlighted what type of answers how, or how you can flesh out your answer skeleton and come up with fully fledged answers. So again, let me take you back to the planning scenario. So the questions, uh, first things first, what you need to do is after reading each requirement, you need to stipulate uh, the requirement so that uh, rather than having to read the entire question you you know what you are supposed to do so when developing the answer plan you can always refer back to the question and see whether you are adhering to the requirement at hand okay so question number one was about steps in training and development question number two was about pros and cons of imposed versus participative budgeting and question number three was about relevant costing are we supposed to keep the machines or sell them? So this is a summary of the requirement. Once you have a summary of the requirement, you uh, start developing your answer plan. So, um, you know, um, so uh, based on the requirement, you come up with bullet points or, or short points. Don't, uh, you know, come up with uh, elaborated answers because you are supposed to summarize. Your, you have to come up with a summary of your answer structure as per the answer plan and you can you know utilize the remaining 25 to 30 minutes to flesh out your answer plan and one final thing which i need to highlight is with regards to uh, uh, the, uh, the the paragraphs the use of paragraphs and the headings and subheadings you can see for the main heading for subtask number 1 i've used the bold and underlined format and uh, the second Subtask was about budgeting styles. Again, I've used the uh, bold and underlined format. And the third subtask was about relevant costing. Bold and underlined format has been used. And on top of that, in order to bring out points under each subtask, uh, in order to bring out or highlight major points, I said it's uh, uh, prudent for you to use uh, subheadings. And the subheadings, there are five subheadings under uh, the first subtask and each subheading carries a bold format, nothing else. And look at the paragraphs. Paragraphs are two to four lines, nothing more, nothing less, which makes the examiner's life easier because the examiner can simply, because, uh, you know, when marking papers, we don't read word to word. We, uh, we, we are involved with something called fast reading. So when we are involved with fast reading, what we do is, uh, you know, we have the ability of picking out the main words. So rather than reading the entire paragraph, we have the ability of picking out main words. And if these main words are there, if these main concepts are there, you end up getting marks. So when you uh, provide answers in separate paragraphs, and when your paragraphs are not too long for each, for each answer point, when you come up with a paragraph, then it makes the marker's life easier for you, for him or her to provide you with marks. So that's that. I'm not going to take you through the um, 
second part uh, you know so in the second section uh, the questions are pertaining to uh, ifrs 16 uh, leases and uh, uh, the second sub task is about uh, digital costing benefits of adopting digital costing and the third sub task is about uh, stipulating kpis based on our website analytics all right any questions guys any questions before we wind up did I make myself clear? So, um, John is saying these answers you have written for the mini mock. What grade would it get out of 150? I think it would be very useful to know what uh, would get a grade of say 85 out of 150 and what would you get say 145 out of 150? Would your, ans would your answers you wrote get full marks or not? How do we know how much detail to give? Well, um, you know, I've highlighted uh, all the points. So I would get something like 145 to 150. Uh, you are not supposed to, you know, a typical student will not come up with, uh, you know, we will not cover all the areas when providing answers uh, because, uh, you know, uh, it's because I'm a tutor, because I, you know, uh, came up with the question, I'm in a position to, uh, you know, cover all the areas. So when um, you, are, you are asking a question pertaining to um, uh, how many points you need to write per task, that is dependent on uh, the uh, uh, weightage provided for each subtask. So uh, the first uh, task is divided into three areas. So the first subtask carries 30%. Second subtask 40% and uh, third subtask uh, 30%. So uh, for uh, each task, you would be allocated uh, uh, a total of uh, 33 marks. Okay. So 33 divided by 100 into 30 is how much marks you'd get for the uh, you know first subtask. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the operational level, um, there's not you need not think too much about uh, mark allocation. Because uh, uh, if now, now if, for, for instance, if you look at the question which we discussed right now, Johnny, um, it's stipulated in, in uh, subtask number one, they are talking about the training and development cycle, or oh, sorry, de training and development program, what we need to focus on when developing a training and development program. So it has five steps. So, you know, irrespective of the number of marks allocated, you need to highlight five steps. Okay, and in the second part, they are saying uh, to highlight the pros and cons of uh, participative and imposed style of budgeting. So in that, uh, you need to stipulate uh, two or three pros, two or three cons for each type of uh, budgeting style. And um, when it comes to relevant costing, it's highly technical because you need to relate to all the numbers provided or the information provided. Okay, so. You know, what I would suggest is uh, uh, focus on coming up with an answer plan. Develop your answer plans properly. When developing the answer plan, try to cover all areas which are stipulated in the requirement. Then try to think whether you have covered all areas, whether you can bring in some additions, you, whether you can add some stuff to the answer. And uh, that's what you need to do to come up with, an, with a proper answer plan. So spend 15 to 20 minutes to plan. That's the best practice which you need to adhere to. If you get that right, then it's a matter of just typing the answer. I hope I addressed your concern, uh, Johnny. Any other questions, folks? Any other questions? One new message. Okay, welcome, Johnny. Any other questions, folks? Any questions? So I'll give you like um, one or two minutes so that you guys can Type your questions if there are any on the tab section or you can switch on a mic and uh, directly ask me 
uh, if there are any questions. Right, so uh, I would actually suggest you to uh, go to our website and click on the OCS page and uh, click here to access free content. And uh, under this, you would have access to two uh, pre scene analysis videos uh, and uh, this mini mock, which we discussed right now, as well as the suggested answer. Okay, and uh, I will be uploading uh, the, uh, the three webinars uh, webinar one, two, and three, the recorded versions as well. Uh, so, having said that, any other questions, guys? So you can contact us via our website, you can email us or WhatsApp us, and uh, you can also follow us on our social media handles. I would suggest you to go through our blog posts uh, by clicking on this icon. Uh, you can refer to our blog posts, which are extremely beneficial uh, for you because all the technicalities pertaining to the uh, uh, case study exams, pertaining to SEMA case study exams has been highlighted. Uh, the type of uh, myths about the SEMA exam, uh, case study examinations, the flaws committed by students, uh, what type of problems are there, and uh, for each of the flaws or problems, solutions and whatnot, and uh, how to develop answer plans, just like what I suggested right now, it's everything is in writing. So uh, go, please go check out our blog posts and uh, check out our website as well. Under the OCS page, you can check out all our material and uh, you can uh, check out our, what do you call it, um, uh, the sample material as well. Okay, so seems like there aren't any questions. So thank you very much guys for joining in. Uh, I wish you all the best with the operational case study sessions. And if you feel that uh, you need uh, help with the operational case study, please do get in touch with us. Uh, you can also join our WhatsApp discussion forum where you can uh, you know, share your thoughts and knowledge with your colleagues. And I am part and parcel of the WhatsApp discussion forum. I'm the admin. So I'll be helping you guys out uh, if there are uh, any problems. So Priscilla, thank you. Thank you very much for the feedback. Uh, good to know that. Welcome Jay. So see you guys, good night and all the very best.